It's great to be back this week. Uh, I was uh, last week away in uh, Oklahoma City. Um, pretty brutal, over 100 degrees every day, a lot of humidity, but you know, I had the opportunity to be with good people and uh, did my job, I suppose, and uh, you know, I had to overcome a lot of things. And as we're talking about overcoming uh, life, uh, it was there was a lot of overcoming of sometimes personality. Hi, Kathy. Uh, personality issues and, of course, uh, work issues, trying to keep uh, aircraft in the air and uh, trying to uh, meet the real customers' uh, expectations. And they are <laughs> in uniform. So this week we're talking about um, shipwrecks. Last week we talked about fear of failure, and I felt we needed to address uh, overcoming shipwrecks in our lives. Um, I used the term spiritual failure last week in introducing this and kind of we're talking that. And um, there, there are often times when uh, our lives are, have storms in them. They're just so powerful that our boats are not able to hold together and we begin to sink. Um, some of these are due to our own failures uh, to navigate rough seas. And, and, you know, as you see the horizon before you, you, you kind of make mistakes. I have sometimes there's huge problems in our lives that, that just blow in, and it's a, as I use the term, a great blow, and that's a seagoing term. If you're on the open ocean, um, you know the wind and the water work sometimes against us, and we start to lose hope. Uh, we start to doubt our ship. We start to doubt our abilities, and sometimes we we even doubt God. Um, that's pretty common. Uh, the Bible's filled with with doubt, um, and we're talking about that. And but those who launch out on the open ocean of this world uh, with a nice wind and uh, they don't really know that the storms that they might meet. Sometimes they might take it for granted um, that they have um, not necessarily obtained their purpose, but they're on, on their way. So as a, as a sailor on board a submarine, we navigated much differently than most of you uh, visualize. Um, we're below the surface as well as on the surface. And I can assure you that whether you're on or below, we never acted recklessly and never felt really quite safe until we entered port. And that's the same in life, that we should never feel quite safe until we re reach the port of the end of our life or heaven. And I, I, I think often we take a lot of things for granted and we start to rest rest in the wrong things and uh so as a submariner we didn't see the sun or the stars for days and often there's people even on the surface that don't see the sun or the stars for days when they're on the open ocean especially when when uh there's there's a storm and uh and they're uh, the waves are rocking and they're on the verge of a shipwreck and uh, you won't either and paul um in acts 27 talked about uh, that very term that they saw neither sun nor stars for many days. And depression can result in that same condition. And as we're talking about people and we're talking about spiritual conditions, we sometimes walk straight into darkness and we, as we have no light and we just walk the wrong way and our cargo gets so heavy so we can't navigate really safe. And it gets so heavy that we can't keep our, our ship on the surface and we sink. Folks often will rather shipwreck with all their goods than have a safely and happy life. But many rather not shipwreck their faith and good conscience and, and, and get rid of their goods and, and, and make sure their ship is safe. Sailors will never succeed if they don't navigate with sound principles. Principles that go back beyond the Portuguese, who to me are the father of what I, I did. They're, they're the father of navigation for my era. And and they'll never succeed in returning to port site because they didn't navigate properly. Likewise, when, when we as broken people um, try to navigate this broken world and this terrible world, we, we find ourselves shipwrecked. Uh, and when we give up hope of saving ourselves by holding on to things that are heavy enough to sink us, we're not as well prepared as if we understand that in God's word, there's a trust and we find mercy in his son and not in our own devices. So tonight, as I'm going to pray, and as we discuss spiritual failure, realize that we all fight the fight of our lives. And even if the sun is shining and there's no waves and you can see the sky clearly, remember how quickly a storm can spin up and toss you to and fro uh, on the rough surf and wind. So let's pray. 
God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for these folks that uh, each week uh, just are so patient and kind to me and say, give me great feedback. And I ask you to minister to them, meet their needs, help them to navigate out uh, whatever, ailing them and just be with them. In your name we ask us, amen. So the conflict is very real, however, isn't it? And the struggle and the stress is difficult and dangerous. And if we don't put on armor or we don't put on the right preparation, uh, you know, we won't believe that this spiritual battle is, is winnable. You know, Charles Hodge, uh, he's, a, he's a theologian, said this, Sal salvation, however gratuitous, is not to be obtained without great effort. And I, I believe that. We're living in a war zone. I, I don't like to list every single thing here, but we're living in a war zone. And I'm talking, I'm talking about things of the Navy. But if, if you were born in the 60s like me, you were living in a similar time that they are today. You know, right, where our boys were fighting overseas in Vietnam and here in the U.S., we were fighting amongst ourselves and on fronts of civil rights and anti-establishment rallies. Today, our children, our boys and girls are fighting in many areas of the world, and we're still fighting amongst ourselves on oppression, polarizing politics, and a new flavor of civil rights. So nothing's really changed, has it? Hi, Veronica. It's good to see you, Ronnie. So in the midst of all this, we find ourselves trying to navigate through spiritual warfare, too. It's intense. It's a close quarter battle. It's wrestling. And you're never quite clear of it if you're doing it in your own power. Uh, while we might be tempted and, uh, and tried what other people have done, Paul tends to help you identify there's, a, there's another real source of conflict, that the enemy of God and man are not necessarily what you can see. These tyrants operate in the darkness, um, an illusion. Uh, is their antagonism and their opposition to God. Um, they are spiritual ones of wickedness, and they, they look to, to choose and pursue rebellion and evil in you. And I, there's plenty of scripture. If you want them, I'll back them up. Uh, but if you remain in, in this abject spiritual failure where you, or you're shipwrecked, your life will be compounded as you have no protection and no confidence in God. And he is the one who really cares for you, and you'll be stuck, and you'll be quagmired, and you'll fall deeper and deeper. And as you continue to stray from his protection, you'll get picked off one by one, probably like a wildebeest on the plains of Africa. You know, and I don't want that for you, and nobody else wants that for you. We want you to be delivered from this stuff, you know. Understanding forgiveness is not enough. You must believe by faith that you're forgiven. You know, so here's, here's some quick statements. The key to... The whole process, stop condemning yourself. You cannot go undo the past, but you can change the future. Others may not forget your mistakes, but God will forgive and he will forget. Remember, God sees the end from the beginning. He's not looking at your life right now. He's looking downstream. He knows what's best for you. So don't get bogged down with your immediate problems to the degree that you cannot see beyond them. God already sees them. He's already been there. He's trying to lead you. You need to trust in him and see he'll see you through the dark hours he'll see you through the difficult times just as you trust him by faith for your salvation trust him to forgive you and restore you to his his purpose for your life you have a purpose god's created you with a great purpose the bible reminds us without faith it's impossible to please him for he that comes to god must believe that he is and he is rewarded of them who diligently seek him so so find your way back to him. Don't, don't get, stay where you are. It's a tribute to a musician that he can make a perfect instrument and, uh, sorry, he can make, take an imperfect instrument and make it play great music. I remember my friend Paul Elias came to my house when Barry was a little boy and we had this little toy piano. It was this big and piano, he, Paul was such an accomplished piano player and organist. He made that little toy piano an art form. And that's what I'm talking about. It's also a tribute to a surgeon who can perform difficult operations in the most primitive of conditions, in the most remote mission station uh, over in Africa without all the sophisticated devices that you might have when you go in to have a, a simple procedure here. But that surgeon is an art artisan and he knows how to do it. And it's even more so a tribute to God that he uses imperfect instruments to establish and build his kingdom. Who are those imperfect instruments? Let me tell you, it's you. You are the imperfect instrument. This is the person God uses. 
don't go looking around for somebody's grave. And these were the people that, that God chose for the foundation of where you are today, thousands of years later, are, were not strong, they weren't brilliant, and they were usually not gifted, and they were usually just those guys. You know those guys? You know th those guys? They were weak men who f often failed, right? Sometimes they were so spiritually clueless that they were, that when you read their accounts, you wonder, how could they be so, you know, I mean, how could, they're, they're like idiots, right? They're, they're just not the best people. I, you know, I, I, I think the fact exists, even in the church today, I'm, I'm in leadership, in spite of my many failures, in spite of my many family failures, perhaps, before me, in spite of my family, family members before me, in spite of my family members next to me, you know, and, and my friends and all that growing up, here I am, I'm still here, and I'm still trying to do the best I can, and I'm one of those dull people that God chose to use. So throughout Scripture, we see God using imperfect people for the sake of his mission. And I can't understand why Jesus chose those guys. Why did he do it? Why did he have a, a, a wonderful woman, a person he chose to appear for, appear to after he rose? Why her? Why, why Peter, who, who is me, like me, brash, outspoken, had a loose tongue, could probably dig, dig his own grave with his mouth, and this is the people he uses? I'll tell you why, because it proves the validity of him, right? The validity of him. He didn't call the popular. He didn't call the rich. He didn't call the successful. He called people like you. He called people like me. He called the poor. He called the broken. And you know who else he called? The faithful. And I can only imagine how confused religious leaders were then. And I can only imagine how confused religious leaders are today by looking at the team of people who are out there doing the work. Many of you, I know you're doing great things. You're doing wonderful things, but I don't want you to remain shipwrecked anymore. I want you to get back in the game and understand that you, you might be thinking to yourself, I'm not, I'm not successful. I'm not rich. I'm not popular, but this is the person he's chosen. And this is where he wants to take it. So from an outside perspective, you see people didn't really matter where they were from. It didn't matter what they had done. It didn't matter who they even used to be. It's the, pers the people that were used to do the good of the Father's will. And you don't believe me? All right, I'm going to run through this list really quick, so bear with me. Abraham was old. Elijah was suicidal. Joseph was abused. Job went bankrupt. Moses had a speech issue. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Can I keep going? The Samaritan woman was divorced about four times and was living with a guy. Noah was a drunk. Jeremiah was young. Jacob was a cheater and a deceiver. And if you, if you know Jacob's, you know, David's a murderer and, a, and an adulterer. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Peter denied Christ three times. And, and man, he just got in all kinds of trouble. Martha worried about everything. Zacchaeus was small and money hungry. His disciples fell asleep while he was a, while he's praying and wanted to be arrested. And Paul, probably the guy who wrote most of the Bible, was what? A murderer himself, persecuted Christian before coming on. So these people are the people that God chooses to work all things for all the good for those who love him and have been called to his purpose, right? So you need to, you need to, I'm sorry, I have to let somebody in. Okay, I think she's already in. All right, so you need to realize that if you ever feel not worthy enough, remember that Jesus had this bunch of people and they're flawed. To share the hope in what? A flawed world. But who would you rather listen to? Would you rather listen to somebody who, who has it all together? Or would you rather listen to somebody who's already been through maybe something you're going through? I always say to people, you know what? I know you're going through this and we're going to get you through this. But you know, one day you're going to help somebody else get through it. Yeah. Jesus didn't call the equipped. He equipped the called. And no matter where you have been through in life, remember that the same power that conquered the grave lies within you. Don't ever, don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget it. I'm sorry, I'm still trying to figure out why this is looking the way it does. All right. So, 
so how 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 can we how can we grasp that that somebody somebody who who declared that he was going to lay his life down for Jesus just just days before couldn't even act like he didn't know him to the point where he cursed him. He cursed. So Peter, I don't know him. I know him. I'll lay down. He grabs a sword. I'm going to do. And then three days later, you have to realize that we are we are flawed. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's we're going to lose the battle that dark night, but we're going to gain everything else on the other side. Take courage because there is someone that you can reach out to that's overcome this world. And 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 don't ever worry about your spiritual failure. God has encouraged you through his love and his grace that he wants to put you back on it back on your feet. Don't stay there anymore. You know, don't don't hang out there. Brokenness is not the same as the spiritual condition that that we're all born with. Brokenness is something we need to overcome. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to get off on a, on a whole tangent on, on sinful condition, but you folks can overcome being spiritually broken. You can come back from that. You know, this is, this is the, this is the road ahead of you. You need to fight through it. You know, you got to insist on, on not always being motivated by your will, but trying to find a way to be motivated by God's will and just keep doing what he is asking you to do and not necessarily what you selfishly want to do. I know me, I'm, I always want to be in control, right? I don't <laughs> want spiritual pride, right? I don't want self-righteousness, but I have it, right? Job was one of those people that had that, right? David, David committed such an atrocity. He's a, it was adultery and murder. You know what I mean? Yet he's somebody that gets restored. God is about, God is about to, about restoring people from where they are and not not leave you where you are. So if you make a mistake, don't stay there. Work your way back out, right? And and I I mentioned all those people Jesus hung out with. They were some they were some pretty they were some pretty questionable characters. But but in spite of where they were and where they came from, you know, they didn't they didn't turn away from God. They they hung in. You know, even Peter said, man, I am like messed up. Get away from me. And Jesus didn't say, you're right, Peter. I better find somebody better, right? He stays with them and he works them through all these things. The wonderful thing that, that, that strains our human thoughts and hearts is as soon as each of us turn from our wickedness and turn from what, what we did yesterday, God runs to meet you like you did with the prodigal son. God runs to meet you. You got to just say, wait a minute. I got somebody who really loves me. Why am I staying here in this in this pigsty? Why am I hanging out here? I got to. He's going to run to meet you. He's not going to hold back from you. And I know I'm. Keep, I know I'm simplifying a lot of these kinds of thoughts because I don't want to get bogged. I don't want you to get bogged down in in me mentioning text and all that. But I want you to understand that there is a, a relationship of understanding for you. That His grace is there like something you've never known. And I, I haven't spent maybe in all these topics this deep in, in the spiritual side. So I got my, I got, I was raised by my mother. This is her, this is her revised standard Bible. My mother was raised in the Lutheran church in, in uh, Renamy, New Jersey. The revised standard Bible changed her life. Even her, even my old address is on here. I can see it. You know what I mean? 603 Sylvan Road, Somerdale. Um, it changed her life because it was a simpler translation. I'm trying to get you to see that my mother could have stayed in her ways, but she had an awakening that changed everything because of hanging out and studying like a, like a philosopher, right? You need to do the same thing, right? You need to turn your back on what you did yesterday. It's called repentance. You turn away from that and face God. You just face God and recognize that he's going to accept you. And then how blessed you are that, that you were really broken yesterday or in, in two minutes ago, and now you're free of that bondage. And there's a wonderful sweetness when God says, take my hand, because he's going to lead you, and he's going to take you forward. And, and, and I, don't, I don't want to leave you there. I don't want you ever staying there. You know, sometimes some of us need people to do this. Some of us don't. Some of us do this in their own living room and privacy of their kitchen. 
in a bathroom, in a basement, in a backyard, you know, by the beach. It doesn't necessarily have to have people there. But I, you, need to, you need to eventually find people to hang out with. You need people of like faith that can, can strengthen you. You know, you need to go forward. So, so this is, I'm moving, moving rapidly through this. So I want to talk about a couple of things. We need to fail forward. How do we do that? By let, learning our setbacks and then by making sound adjustments going forward. If you know what your setbacks are, don't go back there. If you're an alcoholic, I don't need to go hang out at the bar. Okay. I, I, I understand my setbacks and I have to make good adjustments. You gain forgiveness from both God and other people, and it will create change within you and within your circumstances. I, I have uh, a, a huge respect for, for Teen Challenge. Nearby, we have the women nearby here in Providence. They are, to say they're unbelievable is an understatement. They are creating change within themselves and within their circumstances. Why? Because they get around people and they start to embrace change because they accept the forgiveness and they know their setbacks and they make sound adjustments. It's an intense program, by the way. It's not, I'm not, I'm, I'm simplifying it. You see very cha- the very change you make, every person we meet, every bit of information you absorb will come together and it'll create a sound and more positive outcome. You gotta fail forward with people. You gotta fail forward with the family of God. You gotta fail forward with people that aren't going to judge you and be critical of you. You need people who are going to love you, not be judgmental. This isn't religion. This is about relationship, mostly vertical. And then there is a little, sometimes a little horizontal for strength. Secondly, we can't stay in abject failure. Remaining there, I've talked about this for probably weeks. Remaining there creates more trouble. Guilt buries you. Guilt creates bitterness. Guilt creates anger. Guilt compounds your circumstances. It gets worse and worse. You need to choose better how to handle your failures and then preserve on the other side so you can discover opportunities are already waiting for you. They're already waiting for you. Heaven knows that you're, you're on track, okay? These things are setbacks, but you need to get back on track. After you're forgiven, restoration comes right behind it. it leads to more efficient process of living, not an inefficient process, a more efficient. And then you start handling your circumstances that are beyond your control and the result of bad choices much better. Those things get under control. If you stay in your guilt and you fester, those those bad choices are just going to compound. And restoration will never bring you to a positive side you know, of, of the event. Restoration br- will bring us and enable us to a positive side in the event of the toughest situation. So back to the shipwreck from Acts 27. It's God who appointed the end that, that we, would, we should be saved. He creates the skill. He creates the ship. He creates the safe port, right? Remember that there's a duty that's ours. We must give our events to God and put ourselves in his protection. Uh, you know, I had, you know, I, I, I kind of I misled you a little about driving driving submarines, which I did, we had, we had navigation that we would download into the submarine, submerge the boat, and then we would follow that and trust that the navigation was sound. And then our charts were sound, just like this word of God, that our charts were sound, that we knew what the underwater mountains were. We knew the cavity, you know, we knew the terrain, even though we couldn't see it. It's the same, right? You got to, you got to understand he, he created the skill. The ship, the safe port, that's the the duty is for you to follow it. Happy are those who who have such a one in their company, like like Paul did on that ship in Acts 27, who had not not only a relationship with heaven, but he was enlightening them to what to do. There's going to be people around you you're going to have, you're going to be able to um, interact with. You're going to give them wisdom. Right? Because why? Because you're hearing from the very spirit of the living God and you will be able to help them. They'll be even sometimes living under the umbrella of your blessings and they'll be safe and they'll be delivered from 
some of the distresses and dangers of the, even their own lives just because they're alongside you. Unfortunately, once they move along, then they're back into their circumstances. The star of this world works death. I don't know how else to say it. While joy in God is life and peace and the greatest distresses and dangers. This world is, is busted up. It's not getting any better. I, you know, I'm, I'm 59 and it, I, I just feel like it's worse than ever. The comfort of God's promises can only be ours by believing and depending on him, you know, and he, he's going to fulfill his promises, you know, and, and if, and salvation reveals that he, he wanted, wanted to fulfill his promises, you know, he, he appointed one person to, to make a way for you that you wouldn't, that you could believe that he's going to fulfill his promises. Matthew Henry, he's a, uh, He's a Bible commentary said this about Acts 27. If God has chosen us to salvation, he has appointed us that we shall obtain it by repentance, faith, prayer, and preserving obedience. It is a fatal presumption to expect it in any other way. I, 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 that's a strong word, I understand. But I, I'm here to encourage people to commit themselves to following a, a path. I'm here to invite you to follow the path. I'm trying to clearly show you the path, you know, you know, I, I mentioned my mother, my mother was a whack job Christian. I say that to a lot of people. She was unorthodox. I've tried to be that like my mom. I, I try not to ever make people feel uncomfortable with me. I don't want you to ever think of me as religious. I don't want you to think of me as some, some, somebody better than you. You know, I'm no different no no positionally or whatever i need i need the same statement i just read to you and i'm no different but to get to the port safely is is based upon a relationship with god and he truly cares for you and so do we and, and i know I, and i say so do we meaning the church that you sail with they care about you and i and i care about you and i i say this every week as i close and i I'll say it again this week as I'm getting ready to close before I introduce this next week. Reach out to me if you need me. If you don't have somebody local to you, reach out to me. I will, I will give you my number. I will, if you're local, we'll, we'll get together. If you're in Jersey, if you're in England, if you're in where, somewhere else in the country, we'll get on the phone. Whatever it is, I want to help us all to arrive safely in port together. You know, I want to hang out with you for, the, for eternity. You know, but most importantly for this lesson, I want you to get through this life with, with uh, overcoming all the obstacles. And we've talked about a lot of obstacles here, but I want you to get through the obstacle of, of being, being shipwrecked in, in some sort of serious sinful failure. But I want you to get the port and I want you to get the port safely. There's skilled people around you that want to help you. And then ironically, within weeks, I, I, can, uh, I can promise you you'll be helping me. You'll be helping that person. You'll be helping that person because why? That's the way it works. So hopefully this has been good. Next week, we're going to, for the next two weeks, we have three weeks left, by the way. For the next two weeks, I want to do some quick uh, biographical snapshots on, as I close the series, on how people overcame incredible obstacles. And next week, I'm going to talk about, talk about Louis Samperini and how he remained unbroken. Now, if you haven't seen, if you haven't seen Unbroken, it was directed by um, Angelie Jolene. It was her first film. You can check it out. If not, it's okay. I'm going to talk about his life, and I'm going to talk about how he navigated to PTSD um, after he got back. And uh, I kind of kind of ruined the movie for you. Now, so I apologize. Uh, I should have said, warned you that I was going to break break some of the storyline. But anyway, so next week, uh, Overcoming Obstacles, How Louis Zamperini Remained Unbroken. He has a book out and he has several books out. So blessings to you all. I hope, uh, hopefully I'll see you soon in person or I'll hear from you. Again, don't remain, don't remain shipwrecked. Uh, reach out, reach out to people, okay? And I, I so appreciate you uh, checking me out on, on Facebook and also on uh, on over here on Zoom, I got I got one person again. So take care. Love you guys. Bye bye.
Can you hear me, Ronnie? Are you still there? <laughs> 